Sure, sure, sure. All right. So, hi, everybody. I'm Steven. And I'm Beth. And we are Veni Vini Amici. And this evening is our next installment of Rhine Hessen, where we're going to explore the Pinot Blanc grape. Now, you might be thinking, why aren't we talking about Riesling? Well, we're going to get into that in just a second. All the way at the end of the lecture, we're going to bring it back around. But first, about what we're doing this evening is we're bringing people together about wine. Um, this is our fourth package since we've all been sent home, and it's a way to connect with people in a virtual sense. We talk about wine, the history, the climate, the producers behind the delicious wine that you're drinking, and it allows us to connect not only with the wine, but the community around us. This is our first installment of the 2021 Fall Winter Series, so we're really excited to have all of you here tonight. Um, we're going to be going through some of the bigs this season. Uh, we're starting out with something a little bit off the wall, and we're really excited to share this with you um, tonight. And I hope that you'll be enjoying this wine on maybe this hot, humid night if you're really anywhere in the United States on the mm, mm, east of the Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. And so on the right, we're going to have our agenda for the evening. We're going to talk about the Rhinehessen region as a whole, and then a little bit about the Pinot Blanc. We're going to talk about our specific producer. We use it as a case note, like a case study, if you will, like really looking into what's important to that producer. And then through their eyes, we're going to get a sense of the Rhinehessen region. We're going to talk about our bonus, our homework assignment, and then we're going to have a nice little parting farewell. And at the end of that, we're going to have a nice little discussion. And so let's... Yeah, so stay tuned for once the formal portion ends and we can chat. Yeah, and of course, if you do the bonus homework assignment that comes at the end of the lecture, feel free to connect with us between the lectures to let us know what bottles you drank and what the experience was like. So... For all of you that are in our webcam channels, you got those four digits on your fingers. If you wouldn't mind holding up which country we're going to tonight, and that is Germany. Who knows where Germany is on a map? All right. All That's right. Good check. We're we Yay! So many twos. We're getting a lot of twos. Okay, okay <laughs> solid. All right. Um, and let's, we're going to throw them another softball. France. Oh, yeah. Which oh, one's yeah. France? All right. Dig it. Excellent. Okay, Italy. Mm-hmm. Okay, fantastic. Now, who wants to tell us what number three is? Feel free to throw it in the chat if you know it. Somebody in the chat. We, we, we're not going to move until we see, uh, see the... Oh. All right. Hey, yes. first one coming in, Belgium. Yeah, we had to look that up ahead of time. But... I always mix up the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I, no. I switch them, but great, yes. Fantastic. But we're going to Germany. That's we are going to Germany. Number two, Germany is where we're going. Now, a little bit more tricky. Which region are we going to? Where is Rheinhessen? So all of the map, but all the colors that are illuminated are really popular wine regions. They all have distinction. And so if you wouldn't mind holding up your digits, one, two, three, or four. All right. Who knows where Rheinhessen is? Okay, we're getting we're getting a couple of different okay. answers, and that's where we see people that have gotten the correct answer. Yeah. So let's talk about the different regions yeah. before we dive right in. So the number one region is the Rheingau region, and the number two region is the Mosel region. So those are going to be your really premier like they have a lot of heritage steeped in tradition exactly because when we're talking about german wine coming from ye olden agents up until now a lot of the big influences were could you get the grapes ripe enough right we're so high north right the growing season is really short and we're so high north that it was really cold and so grapes need to have enough heat and sunlight in order to fully develop and have those acids from the little tiny berries develop into sugars that can be fermented into delicious alcohol. Okay, so when we look at the Mosul region, right, that's the number two. We're going to start with that. We see this snaking back and forth river. What that does is it provides a lot of southern exposure slopes on that river and that allows a lot of sunlight because when you have that southern exposure especially that southwest exposure and these are steep cliff sides too in the Mosul region and that allows for the sun to help ripen the grapes when we look at the number one region which is the Rheingau region right what we get with that region is we get a uh, a large river on the Rhine here why don't we why don't we take a look at the Rhine River so 
we're going to be looking at it from the perspective of Rheinhessen. And across the Rhine River in this scene, we can see the Rheingau region. And would you like to say a little bit about the town that we're heading into here? Sure. So we're looking at some images from Oberwiesel, which is uh, a town in the Rheinhessen. And it's kind of famous because it has a church that's the... And if you speak German, please forgive me. But the Liebfrauenkirche. And um, it's kind of known for this wine that if you've, if you've ever heard of it, the Blue Nun, this region... Um, the Blue Nun wines were sort of very easy drinking, maybe a little sweet, not, not, nothing too elevated, but they became very popular abroad. So this region of Germany actually really only became known for this particular style of wine. Rheinhessen previously was known for a lot of bulk wine, including this Blue Nun wine. But the funny thing about the Blue Nun wine is it started out as a blue bottle, um, coming from a region that was famous for its nunnery, and it evolved over time to a young woman in a blue habit with a bit of a sly look. And so it it's, has a, a lot of history and a lot of people are familiar with this bottle. But what's really exciting about Rheinhessen is they're putting this bulk wine, slightly sweet, very easy drinking wine behind them, and they're becoming a very innovative and progressive winemaking region. Um, another thing you can see here is that they have this beautiful church here. Um, churches were a very important part of the winemaking history of Germany. Um, the monks and nuns, uh, th this is a big part of what kept winemaking alive and well in Germany for many, many, many years. And so there's still a lot of connection there. And what we can see in the back of this picture, right outside of the city limits, if you will, we can already start to see just the fields of grapevines. And I think that's one of the things that's really fascinating about, you know, when we go over to Europe is that, you know, you have your city and then immediately you have the vines. Okay, so now we're taking a look at that church again, and we're going to pull away from the city, and we're already in the vines, right? And you can see the very steep terrace that we're on here. Like, look look at that grade. That's, and so it's a lot of work climbing up and down these vineyards. But it really helps that sun exposure get into those grapevines. One of the things that we're also looking at is the premier spots for the Rheinhessen are going to be right on that river. But we can already see this shadow cascading down, right? Because we're looking, we're on the south side of the river. And so before we had these like climate impact changes where it's getting warmer in Germany, those sloped cliff sides would really have struggled with ripening their grapes because they wouldn't get enough sunlight and enough heat. Um, in our next picture that we're going to go to, we're going to see like the, the countryside. And that's where we're really looking for in this Rheinhessen region. There's the, this particular region called mm -hmm. the Vanagau in the southern part of Rheinhessen. And it's a lot of countryside actually away from the river that also is creating a lot of this really, really high quality wine these days. And it's really interesting. This region, the reason why we're talking about it today is because we're talking about the wines that you should be paying attention to for the next decade, two decades, and three decades. The wine producers that are in this region are young. They're well-traveled. They've gone other places to work in vineyards, in other countries, in the premier regions of Germany, and they're coming back to their homelands. They're in their late 20s, early 30s, and they're bringing back the world's technology with this um, increased heat so it's easier to grow. You have more flexibility in the vineyards, right? And then in the cellars, they have these new practices. And also it's just more clean than it was back in the 50s and 60s. And so you're just getting better grapes year after year um, and better wine quality can be produced. They're also doing a lot of things um, that are new to the new ish to the region, but are actually old winemaking practices. So one of the most fun things that we read about this producer is they have um, sheep foliage management, which means they, they have sheep running around in the vineyards and they're eating the underbrush. And it's just a very romantic view, but it's also a very um, straightforward way to, to manage that underbrush in the vineyards and to not be using any kind of pesticides. Everything's typically very in line with organic practices. And and that's one of the things that we focus on when we are selecting bottles for these topics is bottles that have story and place and character. And a lot of the times we do get organic farmed. And not that they really 
even would consider themselves organic. They've just always farmed that way because it was good for the land and that they could pass that land on to their descendants. Um, you know, if you look at some mass produced grapes, you'll see that there is no underbrush because they use pesticides and herbicides and, and all these other things that really just are so hard for the soil. And one of the struggles that those, you know, heavily chemical farmlands, uh, you know, when they're doing those that industrial style farming um, is that they have erosion and they have all these other problems that are not so good for passing the land on to future generations. And so having the underbrush and finding creative ways of using sheep in order to help manage that um, is just part of what it is to be, you know, in the European small producer realm. Uh, all right. So yesterday was Pinot or Pinot Noir Day. I don't so. know how many of you indulged us in Pinot Noir, but we were actually drinking this Pinot Blanc, and as it turns out, it is related to Pinot Noir. That it is not exactly directly related. It had to go through one mutation before it became Pinot Blanc. So the Pinot Noir, or as it's referred to in Germany as Spatzburgunder, yeah, it mutated into Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio. Both of those are synonymous, and they're also synonymous with Graubergunder, uh, which is the German way for saying Pinot Gris. And then we had, yet again, another mutation. And I think that these three pictures really show you just how distinctive um, the mutation was, right? You can really see it in the color. Um, but one thing that is interesting to note is that although the skin color has changed, the inside is clear or white in all three of those. And so sometimes you can have like a rosé made from Pinot Noir, and that is because the juice on the inside of all three of those grapes is clear. Yes. You can also have a white made from Pinot Noir. If you've ever had champagne, that's exactly what you might be drinking. A lot of champagne has Pinot Noir, and it still has that white wine color. Mm -hmm. Before we move on, I think it's important before we get into our case study of the wine gut basert, is to notice just how tight these berries are. So we went out to a local vineyard and was helping pick Chardonnay the other week. And you could actually see that there was a lot of spacing between the berries. And that spacing allows for the wind to just kind of blow through and you could allow the berries to hang like inside of the canopy a little bit more. Whereas these tight berry clusters is really gonna help, it's gonna trap like water and mildew and mold can help develop in that. And that's why Pinot Noir and especially these Pinot Grigios, they, they're a little bit more complicated and difficult to grow. They're one of the more delicate grapes. They're also more desirable, but that's one of the reasons they're more expensive because they take a little bit more care and attention. You have to have canopy management and you have to start from bud break, before bud break. As you're having those vines that have in the springtime and they've started to grow, you have to prune them ahead of time in order to grow the berries in a way that is advantageous for them not to develop mold mildew. So we always like to talk about geography and where we are. So we are in obviously the Rhine-Hessen region. That's the title of the lecture for this evening, but we would fly into Frankfurt if we were to go there. And then we would travel a little bit south into the west and we'd cross over the Rhine River probably, you know. Doggy paddle. Doggy paddle, you know. Viking river cruise. Yeah. <laughs> Caulk the wagons. Well, we'd have our oxen go with us. Uh, no, so we'd go uh, to the, the wine gut Basserts. So that's where their tasting room is located, and their vineyards are just outside of that. And so this evening that we're, we're meeting, we're meeting Philip. He's the head winemaker there, and it was wonderful. I reached out to, to the Bassert family, and I had a slew of questions, and they provided me with a wealth of information as well as these wonderful pictures because it, for them, the land, the wine, it's about their family. And I think that's a really important part to connect with, again, is not only with the people in this Zoom call, with the wine, but also the family that brought us this wine that we're talking about this evening. They were very excited to learn that we would be drinking their wine tonight and a little bit curious about how we found it. Uh, yeah, they started shipping to the United States in 2019, although they've been growing grapes for a really long time. Yes. Um, they would actually sell their grapes previously, and it's only recently that they started bottling their own bottles. Yes, about 2014, they made their own label. Previously, they were selling their grapes to other 
um, winemakers. You know, it's hard in that area where in the Rhine-Hessen region where you have a lot of other uh, wineries that are, you know, selling off their, their grapes or if they are bottling it, it's, you know, it is, there's a lot of fertile land there. So you can produce a lot of high volume wine that doesn't have a ton of character or really nuanced quality. And so it's hard to put a lot of money into the infrastructure to you know, produce quality wine um, because the international recognition for the region just wasn't there. And so one of the interesting things that we're going to find out about this case study is just how these young generations are working together in order to produce wines that are interesting and uh, you know, affordable and that will start their reputation moving into the future um, that's worth looking into. Yes, Ryan Hessen is an up and coming region that really is demanding more attention. They're able to be a little bit more innovative and creative here than some of the more traditional um, places like Mosul and Rheingau. Um, they can explore a little bit more, for example, planting Pinot Blanc. Exactly. So one of the nice things that they did share, and this is not from the Pinot Blanc that we're having this evening, uh, but it was just a really cool way to look at the world through their lens, if you will, is that the old style of training the, you know, the trellis and the canopy, they're using this Lyra system and it's based off of the musical instrument. And what it does is it allows for a double canopy management, um, casting a shade over the grapes. It also allows for the grapes to be growing in a way that um, it's easy to take out the leaves, and so that way you get this nice airflow across those those densely tight, and, uh, you know, packed uh, Pinot Noir berries. It helps them to avoid the mold that we were talking about earlier. Exactly, exactly. Um, but yeah, it's just a beautiful, beautiful picture, and just something to to kind of showcase how they're taking something that's ancient and old, and then putting it into their system um, of how they create their wines, and it's um, it's fascinating to see. So one of the nice things, and we're going to kind of hopefully blitz through this a little bit, but while we're talking about vintage years, it kind of helps evolve your heuristics when you're thinking about what wine is and, and how it's created. And I think we're going to talk about some concepts that are pretty important for dissecting wine um, through this. So the 2017 year, had a, it was a beautiful year. Right? It's everything that you want from rainfall and temperature, but they had a late hail. And that hail can just wreak havoc on uh, a vineyard, right? You have crop damage. Um, and then obviously, like once you have, you know, a ball of hail that goes through a cluster of grapes, you really get that mold and that mildew that sets in. The, the berry cluster is destroyed. Um, and so the quality and the quantity is gone. The 2018 vintage. Which that's, is what we're drinking this evening. Yes, it is. It was very hot and very dry. Now, what that means is that um, at the very beginning, when you have the, the blossoms of the grapevines and then they turn into little tiny berries right and they're really acidic i mean when you oh, unedible right uh but that acid turns to sugar right and when we talk about other regions we talk about diurnals right because in the day it's hot so you have sugar development and then at night you have um, this cooling effect and so the acid is maintained when we have really hot really dry vintages what happens is that sugar just takes off it's like a roller coaster going no rocket ship going up really fast right and so as uh you know the the field manager and the winemaker they have to work together to catch it just right you know a day or two in the wrong direction and you're going to get these these alcohol bombs or these acid bombs that just really not pleasant to drink and it really showcases um, the talent of the wine team uh, this wine this evening that i'm drinking uh, and we're going to get into the discussion a little bit later about the wine itself but really has wonderful acidity right if they picked it a little bit later that acid would be gone and it would be really alcoholic and it would be really difficult to enjoy the wine especially even in these hot days that we're having right now it'd be out of balance when you're trying to find balance in a wine you need just that right amount of acidity not too much not too little yeah exactly and because there's so much heat um you know philip was saying that his uh his grandfather his you know the his lineage uh herman had this situation where they would pick at the end of the growing season they'd let it ferment uh and then winter would come and that's the alcohol level that the wine was, right? There was no way to kind of 
uh, slow the process down. But now they have time on their hand. They can pick be before the end of the growing season if they need to. They can temperature control um, the fermentation tanks. So that way you can still have fermentation happening um, as long as you want. You can make a dry wine easier than back in Herman's era. The yeast don't like being too cold. That's true. <laughs> they will not do their thing. In 2019, it was a warmer year and cooled off right at the end. And again, as we were talking about that, when you cool off, you get acid development. That acid can really kind of play well into the berries. And so they said that it created a really interesting wine. And so I'm curious to find out what that interesting wine is. And so maybe I'll pick up a 2019 Rheinhessen region. Yeah. Uh, 2020 was a warmer year with a little bit of rain at the end. And of course, that just makes an easy drying season or easy vintage because you have a little bit more leeway on the days that you can pick. Um, too much of any type of weather, whether it be too hot, too rainy, too haily, any kind of hail, really can screw up a vintage. And the reason rain at the end of harvest or before harvest is very bad is because if you have too much rain, you actually end up diluting the, gr the juice in the grapes and so you're no longer getting this very concentrated juice to create a very interesting and complex wine you kind of end up with a blah wine which is very sad yeah exactly well, one of the things that i think was also interesting was that you were talking about how the yeast right the yeast goes into the wine eats up the sugar makes alcohol okay that's understandable everybody understands that but where do you get the yeast from and so in this region philip opens up the vats and allows the natural yeast that exists in the air to um, go into the wine and ferment the wine it's also on the grapes when it's they press the it's just in the juice and so you, you can always make a decision as a winemaker to use the yeast that's already present in, on the grapes and in the natural environment or or that you go out to a friend who had an amazing vintage the year before, right? And so that's what we're talking about, about the community. So Philip, if he has a friend in that region who had an amazing vintage, they inoculate the yeast or they transport the yeast from that vineyard over into their vineyard and try a little bit more to see if it's the yeast that really gave that impact, that positive characteristic, that complexity um, that was wonderful. If any of you are beer drinkers, you know how important that can be. And that's one of the things that created um, these uh, Belgian beers, the one I think of, these like very interesting Belgian beers. The Belgian yeast is the magic sauce that makes that happen. Exactly, exactly. And so this evening we're going to get into this wine a little bit. Yeah, so, um, you know, I hope you've been drinking along. But go ahead, if you um, don't have any glass, pour a little bit. We're gonna do a little swirl. Yeah, and a little a little cheers. But please feel free to type in the chat what you what you're getting in terms of your taste profiles. Yeah, cheers, <laughs> cheers, everyone. Hmm. So we opened this yesterday, but when we opened it yesterday, we noticed that there was a just a hint of bubbles in your glass. You might be noticing that if you opened it today. Sometimes they call that. Petillon, so it's just a little, a little bit of sparkle, just a tiny bit. Um, drinking it the second day, we no longer have that. Sometimes it's a little bit left over um, from when they bottle and a little bit more um, CO2 ends up in there than yeah. in a normal bottle. But yeah. it's, it's kind of fun. Um, I, you can also have a little bit of fermentation that still happens after it's been bottled as well. Yeah. So that creates yeah. Um, so we get a lot of really nice minerality on this, which is something you would expect from a Pinot Blanc and something you would expect from um, dry whites from Germany. Yep. Yeah. Obviously, there's a, a bit of lemon on the palate. Um, that crisp acidity uh, goes well with the citrus fruits. It all tastes wonderful. But the thing that I like a lot about this wine is that it hasn't seen new oak it was it was in stainless steel so there's no malolactic fermentation but it has a wonderful absolutely just coating mouthfeel right it's isn't the body of this wine it's not too big um to where it's not refreshing anymore but you're getting this increased body um from the lees aging so when the yeast gobbles up all the sugar and then it dies it becomes the lees it's still just it's just dead yeast dead That's yeast dead yeast and so it sits on the lees and that imparts um, a creamy mouthfeel. Gives it body, 
And so it really helps to produce something that's more than just like really tart lemonade. Right. When we say body, this is the difference between, say, a glass of water and a glass of milk. So this still has lighter body in the grand scheme of all wines, but for a white, it has a little bit more body. Some, some whites are going to be a little bit closer to a water level of body. This one has a little bit more substance to it. Exactly. And it helps play into, as Beth said earlier, the balance of the wine, right? So the way we can get a good balance of a wine, the way we judge the characteristics of that is between the sweetness level, which this one is dry. So we're not gonna have, um, that's not gonna play into the effect against the acidity. You can sometimes counterbalance really acidic wine with having um, a higher residual sugar in the wine. So we don't have any dryness, but we do have a pretty high acid wine. And so they have the increased body from this lees aging that they do. And it creates a sense of balance. Without that lees aging, this would be, uh, the acid would be so much more prevalent. Um, and it's not that it would be off-putting, but it would be out of balance. And so they did a really great job creating a well-balanced wine. Yeah, we, please feel free to throw in the chat any notes you're getting. I mean, one of the things we always like to emphasize in these tastings is that there's no wrong answers. We all have different tasting experiences, tasting memories, and this wine might evoke one sort of sen sense of smell or taste to one person and a different one to another. So sometimes you you read tasting notes on wine and you think to yourself, like, I don't really get that. I don't know where that's coming from. Well, I mean, each of us are experiencing it differently. So there, you know, don't be shy. Please, you know, throw, throw anything in there and, you know, see if other people might agree. Um, some other, some notes that are very common for Pinot Blanc mm -hmm. include pear, peach, lemon zest, crushed gravel. And um, if any of you read the Washington Post, there's actually a recent article wherein the one of the famous wine writers um, wrote about how many people write in saying like, oh, well, you know, do you really know the difference between crushed gravel and uncrushed gravel, like the taste of that? It's not so much that you're talking about actually tasting crushed gravel sense of smell and your sense of taste are so intertwined you're really um, kind of trying to find a way to describe the experience and the experience it, whether it be the nose or the palate that when you taste it it evokes this memory of maybe a crushed gravel path in the summertime with the sun shining down filtering through the trees you know, these are they're just descriptors that people use to try, try to describe those experiences and crushed gravel is a note that's known among wine enthusiasts so it's a it's a kind of common link that we can use to try to talk to each other well so when i hear crushed gravel i have a very distinct sense in my brain and that's because when growing up my father wanted to patio in his backyard. And so what did he do? He's like, well, it's expensive to have a contractor come out and build it. We're gonna build it ourselves. So we had about, I think, four tons of crushed gravel dropped into our backyard that we had to put into this excavated plot of land. And then we built it from the ground up. You know, you have your, your sand level, your crushed gravel, your uh, more porous rock, you know, it's a little bit bigger rocks. And then you put, lay the bricks on top of it. Or, And it was like, okay, Cool, cool, cool. So four tons of gravel gets dumped. We're all standing outside. We're, you know, in our work gear. And that smoke that came off of that, that to me imparted what crushed gravel is because I have that memory. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about wine and getting into it and how we describe the wine and we say like this wine is really having the, the lexicography of it, knowing uh, adjectives, going to farmer's markets and, and, and smelling ah, flowers. Smell all the flowers. Smell all the fruit. Because... When we're talking about the flavors, we're not actually talking about what it tastes like, what it what it feels like when it's in your mouth. It's it really is the sense of smell. Um, we were talking about that article and was like, well, you know, for me, I would actually drink the wine and then breathe back out through my nose after and with my mouth closed. And really, what it does is that like the passage of air back and forth between my nose after I've already consumed the wine allows me to get a little bit deeper into the wine tasting. All right. I think. Well, one last note. Yep. I wanted to mention another place you might find Pinot Blanc is Alsace, which it, if you've ever had one, that's that's one of the big regions where you'll find it. And it'll often come in a tall, thin bottle. So if you're really enjoying this and you're looking for some more Pinot Blanc, check out Alsace. Of course. Now we're going to get into our homework for everybody. 
And what that is, is to try a Riesling, right? It's hard to talk about Germany without mentioning Riesling. And so we're this that's what that's what we're gonna do now for a second here. We didn't <laughs> want to have German Riesling be in the wine package because so many people have an opinion about German Riesling. And also we wanted to make the wine package a little bit more affordable. With Riesling, you really do get what you pay for. If you're willing to invest and in this case we're talking about in the thirties for a very nice, slightly aged bottle, maybe the 40s. And when you're paying that $40 price point, the quality of wine that you're getting at that is going to far exceed what you could get for some of the bigger regions. Oh, We're it's incredible, yes. Absolutely. So, so Germany is famous for these dry and sweet white Rieslings. This is some of the best white wine in the entire world. And I'm telling you, you can get it for in the $40 price point. Try to compare that to Bordeaux or Napa. Mm -hmm. Those Cabernet Sauvignons, they, they get, they get um, Bordeaux, especially from the big houses, they get inaccessible. You can buy a wine from one of the best houses in Germany, making some of the best white wine in the world. And it, it's, ex it's, it's an investment. And you know, for a lot of us, it's gonna be for a special occasion, but it's not out of reach the way it is with some of the others. And I think that's, I think that's a factor of the fact that white wine has been out of vogue for a while, but that is changing. So if you're a fan, you might want to get some before it gets expensive. And now we're going to give you some tips about how to find those dry wines, because a lot of people are appreciating dry wines. And Germany has recognized that the world wants dry wines and climate change has helped them to produce drier wines. And so they're going to try to inform the consumer. That's you guys. What is a dry wine? Now, don't get too overwhelmed. We're gonna move past this in a second, but we do have to tell you about the different classifications and the words that you would look for on the bottle in order to find dry wine. So the first one is Trocken. Uh, not to be confused with Trocken Bern aus Lasse, which is going to be very sweet from a great producer and a good vintage will be an incredible wine. But if you're looking for a dry, stay away from Trocken Bern aus Lasse. Um, cabinet is another word that you would look for, um, but that's on the predicate system. And then, so that was before the time of like the kind of everything being really warm and easy to make into dry wines. Um, and so if you did produce a dry wine back in the 50s or 60s, it would have the cabinet label and that would be the highest quality wine because the only places that could even come close to making a fully ripened um, dry Riesling were the absolute best plots of land. Um, and then moving on, we have the current system, which is the VDP. Now, not all producers are in the VDP. Not all, uh, okay, how about this one? Yeah, so the VDP is a organization of high quality German wine producers. You do have to pay to be part of this. So not all great producers are part of the VDP. Not all producers in the VDP are necessarily the best producers. But it's a good way to ensure that you are getting a bottle that is meeting a series of standards. And you'll see the eagle with the grapes inside, which is shown on the slide. Um, and you know, we, we had a bottle of Riesling from a producer who does not participate in the VDP the other day, the very, very old house. Um, and we looked into it a little bit and it's just not their taste to be part of it. So just because the eagle and the grapes are not on there does not mean it's a bad wine but if you see it it does mean it's meeting certain standards and that can help and there are some terms here that you've listed grossis gewachs our german's not fantastic again if you speak german i apologize but a lot of people refer to it as gg gg will be on the upper part of the label on the foil or a if it's a screw time. cap this yeah so that's sort of area where the yep. the foil is yep um and i think this is a great time to kind of uh, talk about a little bit more about what we do outside of you know with these lectures is that we're not sponsored by a distributor or an organization so we really do kind of say what our research tells us right saying that the vdp isn't you the know, be all end all um is probably not uh, an opinion that everybody would share with everybody so i hope that you guys value uh you know the insights that we share with you uh, but germany being efficient as they are 
of course, is starting to try to put this on their labels. Now, I don't think that the very high-end producers are ever going to put this on the back of their labels, um, but some of the you know, the up and coming ones may do this to really help communicate to the consumer what level of, of dryness this is. Especially now, those that are exporting throughout the world because this is becoming a standard. You'll see this on some bottles from say um, the Finger Lakes as yep. well. Of course, yeah, that's a great point to add. And now just because somebody has a medium dry wine, because the field managers and the vintners are really coming along and they're they like we said they're well traveled they're educated they have all these techniques a lot of times they're actually going to use sweetness to create this body and this mouthfeel um, it's not going to be like the rieslings that you maybe had back in the 90s or the early 2000s like because the climate has changed the field managers and the vintners, they get to choose what they do with the wine. And sometimes their vision is to have a little bit of sweetness on the wine to help create this body and this experience for you as the consumer. I'm glad you mentioned that because I think, you know, we gave you some tips to look for dry Riesling and we have one last one that's mm -hmm. a really good one. But don't be afraid to try a sweet Riesling, a Riesling with some sweetness again from a good producer. Some of these wines are out of this world amazing and they pair very well with a number of foods so worth a shot consult with you know your local wine shop owner if you're not sure they'll help you out <laughs> consult with your local wine shop it's, i like how it sounds like consult with your doctor but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah or us you yeah or us, us. <laughs> we're always here for you guys um and the very last one is obviously to look to the science as we were saying, the acid turns to sugar when a, the Riesling grape is fully ripened and it's going to produce the best wine. That sugar, when it's fully fermented and dry, turns in the alcohol. And that is an ABV of 12%. If you see 12% or more on a bottle, it's going to be dry. So 12.5 um, would be the end all be all. And then you don't even have to look at Trokin or Cabinet or Is it Gigi. part of the VDP? Is it not part of the VDP? Does it have the scale? None, you don't have to worry about any of that. If it's greater than 12% alcohol, there's almost zero chance that there's a lot of sweetness on there. Yeah, and that's our, that's our, our winning tip. Um, so at this point, I think we kind of have our closing remarks and we hope that you guys join us in a month. Yes, this is the beginning of a series. If you ordered the package, we have many more of these to come. Um, we'll be doing them once a month, and we really hope that you'll join us for more of them. We welcome feedback too. If there's more things you want to hear about, if you like hearing more about the history, or you like hearing more about the winemaking, we'd love to hear from you, and we can try to incorporate that as we go forward and when we're doing our research. Of course. and. You know, as always, we love connecting with everybody. Um, so feel free to chat with us between the lectures, whether it be um, email through our website or uh, directly on Instagram. We love hearing from you. And or on the MS Teams channel on the PTOS where you can interact with other people. <laughs> of course. And for those in the chat, we're sending a link to the website um, as well as this bottle is still available for purchase at uh, Wine Access. And the promo link to get $50 off is you know, in the chat for the people that are live with us. Um, but if you're on YouTube, it is um, in the description below. And uh, at that point, I think we say like, comment, and subscribe for those in YouTube. And we're going to end that stream. And so, so while we're, yeah, so yeah. basically great to see you all tonight. For those on YouTube, good night. Um, we're shutting down the YouTube 